Hey guys, Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for listening to our content and please like and subscribe. Jeff Francoeur here with Pure Athlete. Before we get to today's guest, I want to share with everyone that we have uh, our first partnership with Booster. Now, Booster is the high school sports number one athletic fundraising for teams and groups, and uh, their owner and CEO is a good buddy of mine, go to church with him, and a great guy, and instead of me telling you what it is, I'm going to bring him on, so Chris Carneal, thanks for joining us. Jeff, thanks so much. So excited to sponsor Pure Athlete. Love your message, love your vision, love the heart and the values behind it. I'm a former college athlete. I'm a coach of my boys and my daughters as well, basketball and baseball. And our company I started 20 years ago, we work with schools, K through 12, and we serve them by raising funds. The past 20 years, we've raised schools, teams, and groups over $600 million, and we want to continue to serve more schools. So if you're interested in hearing how we can come to your sports team, uh, your school, or your group, uh, choosebooster.com. Again, go to choosebooster.com. Chris, thanks for being a part of this. A big supporter of youth athletics, high school athletics, and we're looking forward to a good partnership with you, man. Absolutely. Love what you guys are doing. Look forward to serving and uh, helping schools raise funds. All right. Well, welcome to the Pure Athlete Show, where we're focused on helping young athletes and their parents and even coaches navigate this youth sports journey in the in the healthiest way possible. Uh, today, we've got a great guest. We're really excited to uh, to have him here. Uh, just to tell you a, a couple of things about him, our guest today uh, was raised in Taylorsville, Mississippi. Uh, he played multiple sports growing up, and, uh, and you'll hear about that, kind of excelled at a bunch of them. Uh, his dad was a high school principal there and, and also one of his coaches. Uh, and I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to bring Brad and Jeff in on this. Brad, our guest today is a, uh, is a neighbor of yours. Yep. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about him? Well, you know, he, uh, he lives in our neighborhood. He lives across the street from us. Um, his house wins the HOA award usually every month. My house gets the HOA citations every month for the way our yard looks. But uh, now, you know, when you hear that a, that a famous NFL quarterback moves into your neighborhood, you, you kind of have a, an idea that he may have an ego. But Jason is just the nicest guy. He's spent so much time with my boys. And I mean, to have my son run uh, football wide receiver routes being thrown to you by an NFL quarterback is like it was a thrill of a lifetime and he's just been he's been great to have across the street and just we have a lot of nice conversations and I think we had an epic uh, fourth of July fireworks uh, display that uh, a couple couple years ago that Jason contributed to a lot so yeah just just a great guy and just um, thought it was uh, he'd be he talking to him about kind of his youth and growing up and his high school experiences I thought that he'd be a, he'd be the perfect guest to have on this show. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so you've heard the name Jason several times, but I don't think we've formally introduced it. It's Jason Campbell, uh, Auburn quarterback, uh, back in uh, you know back in 2004 uh, through 2007. Is it Jason? No, 2004 was my last year, so it was uh, 2000 2004. But the last year is all that matters. Yeah, anyway. I was going to say, that was college. the year everybody remembers, uh, <laughs> undefeated season, if I remember right, huh? Right, that was our undefeated season that we kind of got robbed of the national championship. But, uh, you know, we won't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> who do you think, uh, if there had been a playoff that year, who do you think would have been the, the four teams that you guys, or the three other teams that you guys would have faced? And obviously you probably felt like you had a good shot of, of winning it if that was the format. Yeah, it most definitely would have been – uh, USC, Oklahoma, uh, us, and uh, Utah. Uh, Utah that year had Urban Meyer and Alex Smith was their quarterback, and they was undefeated as well. So we had four undefeated teams uh, in the BCS, and we had the toughest schedule of the four and, you know, had the largest margin of victory versus our opponents. But, you know, still at that time, we didn't get a chance to play the national championship game. We had to play in the uh, Sugar Bowl, which was the night before the national championship, against a really good Virginia Tech team. Virginia Tech was a uh, team that was 10-2 and two and had USC beat. Uh, they ended up beating right there at the end uh, that year. So, you know, but I feel like our season was the season that kind of changed college football. It's the reason that playoff talk began to start and uh, – 
So, you know, I claim the the history is we were the team to, to get everything going as far as giving more people opportunity to, to compete for a, a national championship. So, Jason, not only, you know, did you have an undefeated season, but for some of our our younger viewers who um, – who don't remember that season, Jason was also SEC Player of the Year that year, three for 20 touchdowns. Uh, so, you know, what a, what a fabulous senior year uh, you had there. And then you went on to a pro career, uh, drafted in first round. You guys yeah, remember I all mean, that? Yeah, the, the, it's not the Redskins anymore, right? It's the Commanders now, <laughs> but you were drafted by Washington. Uh, and what, spent nine seasons in the NFL. Yeah, I was drafted by Washington, uh, played in Oakland and uh, finished my career. I went to Chicago and finished my career in Cincinnati. And uh, I was fortunate enough to play 10 years in the league and um, and everything. So I had a, actually had an opportunity to play three or four more years. I remember getting the offer from Baltimore and Cincinnati wanted me to come back for another year or two. But I was kind of at the point where I was just kind of tired of – I just wanted to do something else in life. Uh, I went through a lot of changes when I was at Auburn. I had a different offensive coordinator each year. And then when I was in the pros, I think out of my 10 years, I had at least six or seven. I can't remember the count, but I just didn't have it in me anymore to just continue to just want to keep going. I wanted to get out while I was healthy enough to kind of move on and as well. And, you know, I enjoyed the great experience. I enjoyed the ride, but it gave me an opportunity to get back into the community back at home where I was from, uh, spend some time with my nephews and my family and everything. And, you know, football was great. You know, it helped give me a platform. But like I tell everybody, it's what you do with the platform that matters. You know, it's not how much money you make. It's not about, you know, how many games you played in, but what kind of impact have you made, you know, on where you come from as far as being involved in the community, helping kids reach their dreams and success and letting them know and understand that, you know, it's more out there for you. But you have to put yourself out there and make yourself be available for those opportunities. You know, you can't just – you know, sit in the sit in the house and play video games and just expect things to just happen for you. You got to get out and work. Everything that I've ever achieved in life uh, for me was a huge sacrifice. I had to give up something. And for me, it, it meant like not being out late hours growing up. I remember my dad had us on a curfew and some of my friends that didn't have curfews were just as talented. But, you know, you got to have discipline and discipline is the only way that you can uh, reach the pinnacles of the goals that you set out. And it's sacrifice. I'll tell you, like, you, there's times you can't be with your friends. There's times you got to be home studying. There's times you got to be, you know, just doing things that you're supposed to be doing and not necessarily just always having to be doing something that's fun. Uh, you know, was the whole sh the whole ride fun all the way? It wasn't always fun, but I tell you, it was always worth it at the end. Um, when I'm able to look up in the National Football League and you say, hey, I finally made it. Now, here I am from a small town, Taylorsville, of maybe 1,500 people, population mats. Uh, to a school and, uh, you know, you end up making it to the big leagues. And uh, so it just goes to show you, no matter where you come from, how small, uh, you know, if it's for you, it's for you. You just got to believe and work hard at it. Before we dig into your childhood and some of the great stories that I can't wait to hear, I heard you recently got married. And so you're kind <laughs> of taking the plunge on that. So between that, what else are you kind of doing right now uh, with your time? Yeah, I recently just got married. Been a long time coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've, been, we've been praying for him. We really yeah, have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time coming, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. I ended up marrying uh, my closest friend. Uh, we was friends all the way through college. And I tell you this, like we never dated. We never tried to talk to each other. We always just prayed for one another, supported one another. And in 2020, um, you know, which was a rough year for a lot of people, you know, we end up kind of taking the next step as far as like, you know, we've always seen each other as friends. But my mom told me 10 years ago, she said, how come you never talked to her? Like, you know, Shayla, you know, that's like she seems to be an awesome person and y'all seem to get along. And I was just like, Mom, I don't want to mess up someone that I'm that close to. You know, and she was just like, well, if you want to be married to be married a long time, you better marry your closest friend. Yeah, so, mama's know. You know, yeah, they know better. <laughs> All right, so she was like, your wife's supposed to be your best friend, so you know. So we ended up kind of dating. The first month was kind of, you know, awkward because you're trying to get out of the friend zone and to the point where I'm actually, like, dating you. So, you know, but once we kind of got past that, man, we dated for, like, nine, ten months, and we was engaged, and then we was married this past March. So, you know, we was just uh, fortunate enough, man, that two people were still able to come together and uh, make that happen. So I'm happy. 
and everything. And so marriage life has been new, uh, taking it one day at a time and trying to figure out each other's schedules and, and different things. But I embrace all of it. It's been fun. That's great. Yeah. Kids anytime soon. Hey, that's what we're working on, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I'm, you know I'm, I'm, I'm for, that's a different. Uh, right, you know, I'm 40 years old. You know, I gotta, I gotta get going. Uh, clock kicking. Well, you can borrow one yeah, or two of mine if you want. I got four. <laughs> yeah, you can borrow one of mine too. Uh, but no, man, we're excited to have you on. Obviously, uh, you're a big role model here in the Atlanta area for a lot of uh, kids, and that's kind of what we're talking about today and what we're very passionate about. And so I kind of want to kick it off by just asking, give me your best childhood sports memory. A good one, (laughs) not a bad one, but one of your best memories from when you were younger. Oh man, that's a, that's a good question. I will say this. I remember we used to always play football in the yard and you throw the football up and there's like 20 people out there. Whoever catch it, everyone's trying to tackle that person. We call it Killer Man. <laughs> nice. <That's, laughs> you know, not a nice name for it, but that's what we call it because if you caught the ball, everyone was trying to, you know, was after you. So you learn very quickly and early on how to run away from people. And then <laughs> so then my dad saw me out in the yard throwing a ball one day. And I used to play baseball all the time when I was young. And, you know, I was always the pitcher and uh, played a little bit of shortstop. So when I started playing uh, football, I couldn't play into seventh grade, but my daddy saw me throw in about fifth or sixth grade. And I remember, you know, him vividly saying, man, you know, you can you got a really good gift. Like, I didn't teach you this. Like, you have a really good arm. And I remember him just at that point started putting me in camps and everything. And I was throwing a ball in the yard. And one day we was in the yard and he decided to play catch with me. And we had these rose bushes behind the, behind him. And then, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. You got those huge rose bushes. I'm talking about thorns. It's like, you know, this long. So <laughs> he's playing catch. You know, I'm throwing him the ball and everything. And, you know, I'm messing around with him a little bit. So I try to throw him a, a jump ball a little bit, kind of make him, you know, move his hips a little bit. I'm like, you just standing in place. You got to move. You know, I would hit you on the run. <laughs> so I threw him a ball and he went for it to try to catch it. And he caught it. And he tripped up and fell directly into the uh, oh. thorn bush. <laughs> He was like, fell right into the middle of it. And I would just sit as a kid like, oh, I'm in trouble. I'm in yeah. trouble. I'm in trouble. So then he holler, hey, come help me. Come help me. So then I try to go help it. And mama run outside. And she like, what's going on? Why, why is your dad in the thorn bush? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> so we know getting him out of the thorn bush and, um, and everything. Of course, he was, you know, had these little sticker brows all over him. So we trying to get it out of him. But from that point on, he was just like, well, I know for one thing, you have a great arm. And I remember telling my parents when I was young, I had this vision and dream that I was going to play professional sports. At the time, I didn't know it was going to be baseball, football, or basketball. But I did have a dream and a vision that I would one day play in professional sports. And uh, and that always stuck with me. I, I love that his, his best memory involves he playing with his dad in the yard. Oh, yeah. Not on a team, not playing for a championship, but but playing with his with his dad. That's That's very cool. Hey, so what what sports – when did you start playing baseball, football, basketball? You know, because a lot of kids wonder sometimes, and especially you know this now with the football thing. I know a lot of questions. I'm dealing with that with my wife right now. My little guy's about to turn seven. <laughs> I want him in a helmet smashing people. But I'm getting a little outvoted. But when when did you start kind of each sport for you? Well, I tell you what, I started playing baseball at third grade. Uh, baseball was uh, – it was kind of an easier sport to pick up. And uh, start playing. You start swinging a bat in the yard. And at the time, my parents, I used to watch my dad and play softball a lot. They used to play these softball tournaments. So I was kind of used to watching them play baseball. And I had an older brother who's six years older than me that actually lives in Sewanee uh, here. So, you know, watching them guys play kind of got me going. And I remember playing early on. I remember my brother played peewee football. And I remember my dad telling my mom, he was just like, well, if Jason wants to play peewee football, we're not going to allow him to play because we learn through our other son that it's kind of not good to put them out there, especially if you were some coaches that kind of don't know what they're doing. If you're going to handle little kids, you want to make sure that these guys are understanding the game and teaching the kids the way they're supposed to. So they didn't have a really good experience with his peewee team. So I didn't start playing actual tackle football until I was seventh grade. And uh, up to that, I always just played yard football or just went to camps. But then once I became a seventh grader, they actually let me start to play tackle football. And I think that's the best time to start playing tackle football, honestly, because you don't wear out. A lot of kids start out super early and they end up eventually they end up wearing out. And 
because football is such a grind. You know, like baseball, you can play catch, you can have fun, you can hit some balls and still have fun. But in football, you put those pads on and you're hitting. It's a constant hitting on your body. And I, I just feel like if you can start at seventh grade or or eighth grade, I just feel like that's the right time to get in football. I think if I'm going to play, if I have a, a son and he wants to play football, I think from up to that standpoint, I want to play in flag football. I want him to play in like football games like that where he's learning the game while his body continues to grow. And then once he gets to 12, 13, now we can talk about let's play tackle football and all try to put it all together. So, you know, basketball was something I started early as well. Basketball, I started playing in like third grade uh, where I was just playing a little tournaments and different things and all the way up through, up through high school. So I was involved in sports and sports taught me a lot about you know, you actually build a lot of friendship through sports, but as well, it talked to you a lot about how to win and when you lose, how to deal with losing, you know, how to bounce back. So I always encourage every kid, man, if you can get involved in some type of competitive environment, that's something that pushes you where you're just not always comfortable, but you got to do something uncomfortable in order to be the best or to grow. So that's what I always try to tell young people. So, Jason, one, one of the things we're talking about a lot with Pure Athlete is we have these things we call the five pillars. And one of those pillars is character. And you just talked about, you know, sports teaches you how to win and it teaches you how to lose. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about, you know, what you learned in all that and what, what you would want other kids to, to hear about all that? Yeah, that's a great question because when you're winning, you know, everybody wants to touch you. Everybody wants to be a part of you. Everybody wants to tell you the greatest thing since life spread. And then, you know, you lose a game, you know, sometimes you learn hard at the professional level uh, how bad and how quickly people can write you off. But when you learn as a young kid how to be competitive, I always my dad always told me, he said, so I'm going to always be honest with you. He said, I'm not going to always tell you what you want to hear. And and so don't expect that. He said, my job is not to be your friend as your parent. My job is to be your parent and help guide you. And uh, he said, so there will be times that you may get mad at me. But that's OK, because at the end of the day, I'd rather for you to earn my respect than me just you just liking me because that's not going to help you grow. So I think playing in sports when he was coaching me as a young age, he was always harder on me than some of the other kids. But then at the same time, because he knew what I had a passion for, but he knew it wasn't going to be an easy road. And I just think like when you play sports and everything, it teach you how to get along with others. Like it teach you how to just not just always look at life as yourself, but look at how to help people around you. Because when you play in team sports, especially in football, I got to depend on the person beside me to take care of their job. And that person is depending on me to take care of my job in order for the play to work. You know, it's not like where you play tennis or you play golf, you're pretty much in control of your own golf swing. You're in control of your own tennis swing. Like when you play team sports, it teaches you more about being responsible for the person that's playing along with you. And it teaches you to understand that if you want to achieve more, you got to put your selfish ambitions out of the way. You got to become an unselfish per, uh, player as well as an unselfish person. And I think once you learn how to win, you got to understand you can't get too high to the point where you feel like you arrived or you unbeatable. Like you got to understand that when you start to win, now you become the target. And that's how it was for us in high school. We had a winning program, but we knew every team that we played, they was gunning to get us because we was now the team that they that they wanted to try to try to be and want to beat. And in order for us to stay at that success, we have to continue working even harder because now the more you win, the harder it becomes. And that's one thing I had to learn. And then the other thing is when you do reach, have to face defeat, defeat teaches you that not to ever get comfortable. And it also teaches you about how to get back up because once you get knocked down, you got to learn and understand you can't stay down for long. You learn it. You take your lumps. You look at it. See how can you improve and you learn your biggest your biggest things in life. You learn is through some mistakes sometimes. So you can't beat yourself up to a point that, you know, you're not giving yourself a little bit of room to grow. And I think, you know, learning through those things and when you lose those tough games that you think about. Over the years, sometimes I think about the ones that got away more than I think about the ones that we won because it was always one play here or two plays there that could make the difference. And like I always tell guys when I'm coaching them, you never know which play is going to be the play to be the change in a ball game. It's the same way in life. Like you, when you're making decisions when you're out with your friends or you're out with people, you know, the decisions that you make and the choices that you that you choose 
all going to have some type of effect on your life. It's either going to be a positive effect or it's going to be a negative effect. But the good thing about it, you get to make the choice. And sometimes those choices are not going to always be appealing to your friends. Sometimes they're not going to always be the be the 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 coolest choice. But that's OK. If you know that it's the right choice, you know, that the right choice is going to always grow you further. Like I always tell you, you can grow fast by yourself, but you can go far with someone else. And that's the thing is, is about moving forward because I didn't get to this platform by myself. I had great teammates. I had great friends. I had great parents. I had, you know, people that pushed me, people that if they saw saw something and we was out, we was raised by the community when I grew up. Like if you was out and if someone saw you was around somebody that you shouldn't be around, your parents would know about it and they would sit down and talk to you about it. And it wasn't that they was trying to tell you you can't be with someone they just trying to let you know that the choices that you make may affect your dreams that you're trying to reach to and uh and that's and that was tough love and i always feel like through those years of being loved on in a tough way as well as being loved on in a good way like my dad and would, would whip me and then after i got the whipping he'd tell me why he whipped me but then he also told me he loved me so you know it lets you know like hey he's disciplined me to be better not disciplined me because he doesn't like me he disciplined me because he know I can be better. And that's why I tell kids, challenge yourself to be the best, be better. Don't just be the kid that just want to fit in. Don't want to be the kid that just want to be a follower, follow what the other kids do just to be cool. No, be a leader. Stand up. Yes, it's hard work. Yes, you're not going to always do everything right. That's life. But at the end of the day, though, if you choose and you stick to, true, to, stick to who you are as a true person, it will always find a way to work itself out and coming back to you. Man, that's powerful stuff. I'll tell you what. And, you know, I know you're a multi-sport athlete, and this is one of my things I'm very passionate about, and we've talked between the three of us. What would you tell a parent that has a nine-year-old kid that says, hey, I want my kid to specialize in one sport at nine years old? Because, unfortunately, there's parents out there that are doing that at this age. And I know for you, one thing, you know, I was lucky enough to play 12 and a half years in the big leagues in baseball. Playing football and basketball made me a better baseball player. Playing baseball made me a better football player. It made me tougher. And, you know, so what, what would you tell a parent uh, that wants their nine-year-old kid to specialize? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, I work with Auburn NIL now. I do some radio stuff for Auburn as well. And so I'm still having a chance to be around the game a whole lot. I have young nephews and a lot of mistakes, I wouldn't necessarily say mistakes, but a lot of things that the parents do is they try to push these kids into one sport and they try to tell them that, hey, you're going to do this one sport year round. And my only problem with that is you got to get a kid an opportunity to take a break from one sport and get to the next sport because each sport teaches you something different. And your biggest learning curve is when you're a, t a teenager. So I learned how to do the differences within baseball, the differences within basketball, the differences within football. And then once I got to high school, I narrowed it down to my two highest sports that I feel like, OK, I can have a scholarship in and I can focus on. And those are two that I chose to choose on from 10th grade on through 12th. But if I'm a parent, I don't want my kid to get burnt out on one sport because you just never know how this kid's body is going to develop. He may become better in another sport. Like I started out in baseball. I was a really good baseball player. I was a really good basketball player, but then football was the one. I remember my mom told my dad when I was young, she said, I don't really want him to play football. And my dad was just like, but I see a gift. He has a gift. Like, I think we need to give him the opportunity to play football and just see where it goes. And then see me, my dad talking to my mom about it and then her saying, OK, I'm going to listen to you on this. And then actually getting a chance to play football. Football was the one I actually went to the pros in. And even though I got a basketball and a football scholarship, it gave me an opportunity to have a choice. I wasn't limited because I was only limited to one sport, but I was talented enough to play multiple sports. And that's why I say, like, give your kid the option to play, because one thing I do know, sometimes when they're not in season and they're young kids, they only can train for so long. But if they're involved in other activities that's making their mind work and making them participate and compete, you're helping them grow as a young person as well, because if you let them be too idle, that's when trouble starts to happen. That's when negativity and different things start to start to sink their way. But as long as they're active and involved, as long as they like the sport. And I always say this, if a kid signs up for a sport, he got to see it all the way through. He or she got to see it all the way through. There's no I'm going to sign up and I'm going to quit because I'm not having my way the first week or it's not going my way because uh, -uh you signed up. For, you signed up to this sport. 
You need to see it all the way through because they may not like it in the beginning. But if they stick through it and they stick in it, then they may soon start to love it. And then it'll be hard for you to even want to you won't even hear anything about. I don't want to play this no more. I don't want to do that. So I just think that uh, I've seen more guys burn out playing one sport by the time they get to high school or get their first year in college and don't want to do it anymore because they stuck to one sport. Most of the guys I've seen play professional sports or play even at the high levels of college have all been multi-sport athletes all the way from elementary all the way up to high school. And and I think that has a lot to do with changing the mindset sometimes and allowing them to enjoy the fun of the game because you want them to still have fun while they do it. You don't want them to make it feel like it's a business when they're young kids and everything. Like, let them have fun playing sports, enjoy sports. And I think a lot of parents look at the money that people make on TV and just say, no, you're going to stick to this because I need you to do this. And we and, and we think and that's the wrong way to approach it. Let the kid have fun and enjoy the sport. And that's why you see so many Tommy Johns now in baseball, because some kids play baseball year round. It has now become a 365 day a year sport. And if you got a young kid that's a pitcher and he's throwing, 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 that's a lot. So I just think that, you know, we have to understand it's not work harder. It's just be smarter at how we approach things. So, guys, I'm going to play devil's advocate to both of you. Yeah. Um, you know, you guys, you guys aren't old, but the culture is changing. Uh, it's a little different today than it was when both of you were, were young people going through. And, you know, travel baseball, let's just take baseball, for example, is just, is just all-consuming now. And, and, and that's true in almost every sport. So what do you say to the parent who says, well, you know, my son Johnny or my daughter – if they don't do this year round, they're just they're going to fall behind, and uh, because everybody else that they're playing with on their travel team is playing 150 games a year, uh, what do you what do you say to that parent? Well, I want to interject just one yeah. more thing to that question, but they're also going to say their kid is not Jason Campbell or Jeff Francoeur. Sure. You know that that uh, um, you know you guys are incredibly gifted athletes. We're incredibly gifted athletes, and. And so if they feel like their child is kind of on the edge of being a possible college athlete, uh, you know, what do you say to like, well, they, they're going to have to specialize at some point to have that opportunity, not maybe play 150 travel no. baseball games. Obviously that's not healthy, but what would you say to that? Well, I think, you know, just I'll let Jason answer most of it. But like when you said with baseball, you're, you're, I would tell you your, your arm for a kid, you're only supposed to throw so many pitches and your arm needs time to rest. I told uh, last time, Jason, all the guys from John Lester to Smoltzy, all these guys used to tell me, they didn't throw for three and a half months when the season was done. I mean, stepped away. And they said, your arm's got to have, have a rest. And I will say this, you know, like I said, playing football made me a better baseball player. It got me grit. It got me toughness. I learned to develop. And at the end of the day, you know, if parents, what I would tell parents, if you're going into it to get your kid a scholarship and get your kid to the pros, then you're in it for the wrong yeah. reasons. Yeah. Yeah, I piggyback off what you just said, Jeff. Like I said, if if you're trying to, you know, get your kid at a at a young age to think that he's supposed to get to the pros to take care of you, you know, that's already the wrong mindset. You know, like, like that's not your kid's job. You know, your kid is a your job as a parent is to raise your kid to be the best person that they can possibly be. And if along the way, if you see their ability has a chance to to prepare them to the next level. You know, your job is to take them to camps, just make sure that they're in things they're supposed to, that they can become the best player that they can be. But necessarily not putting that pressure on them to say, hey, I, you got to make it to the league or this was all worth for nothing. Like, that's not true because sports teach you so much about life. And, you know, some of the most life lessons that, that we've gone through, you know, I credit like being able to play ball helped bounce, helped me bounce back quicker from. You know, where people that probably didn't play sports, they struggled a little longer uh, because they didn't understand that bounce back effect, and especially when you play quarterback or you play baseball or basketball. You got to have that that quick mentality to put something behind you and move forward because you you can't stand too long dwelling on something or a bad play or dwelling on, you know, a play that happened two plays later. I mean, earlier, like you got to be constantly like moving on to the next play. And then once you finish the game, you can always go back and review the film and watch what you did wrong and correct it. But that mentality teaches you to like keep moving on. If you make mistakes in life, keep moving on. 
And I think these young kids, sometimes it's so much pressure put on them that when they make a mistake, they get beat up on it during the game and when they get home. And I'm just like, no, you need to let the kid have an opportunity to make the mistakes. Let them make the mistakes. If they make the mistake, then you can always talk to them and correct them about it. But don't make them feel like they're already professionals because even professionals make mistakes. So I just say, man, just uh, let the kids have fun and enjoy it. Like, you know, Jeff was saying, me playing football, it teaches you toughness, especially like physical toughness and mental toughness. Uh, you know, playing baseball teaches you a lot about the different angles in life. You know, the, the way that you hit the ball and the way that you got to hit curves and you got to throw, you know, fastballs and got short stops, got to throw the ball at an angle. You got to make a decision. I'm going to throw it to first base or I'm going to throw it to home plate to get the guy out. You know, it just think, it make you think fast on the move. And, you know, I say basketball is just about most of the time it's just athletic ability and uh, and being able. It's not always the guy that's most athletic, but it's the guy that the peers player. Some of the best guys to play the game are some of the best shooters you've ever seen. You know, and Larry Bird and Steph Curry. They're they're not the biggest guys on the basketball court, but they have the biggest impact on the game. You know, so I just think it's just how guys you know approach the the playing field my thing is if my kid gonna play i want you to be all in i don't want you to have one foot in one foot out like i want you to make sure that you're all in because if you're one foot and one in and foot in and one foot out we're never gonna know like how much you really love this or how much like i'm supporting your dream this is your dream not my dream i want to help you support your dream you know jay one of our pillars is grit and I think this is perfect for, for us to ask this question at this time. You know, you, obviously you sound very, you know, your dad was very involved with you and, and pushed you a lot in a good way, as you said. Tell us a story about in high school when you were on his basketball team and, you know, kind of <laughs> guys got on you about being maybe daddy ball, this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, how did that drive you? I mean, did that kind of start for you, just the vision to I'm, I'm going all the way? Yeah, that's a, that, that started for me, Jeff, back when I was uh, ninth grade. Uh, my dad was our head basketball coach on the football team. He was our defensive line coach. And I remember when I got to ninth grade and we was going out for the basketball season and, you know, some of the guys was just like, you know, Jason probably going to only start because his dad is the coach and, and you know, he's the coach's son and he's going to play favoritism to him. You kind of hear the parents, as, even as a kid, I heard parents chatter, you know, like, you know, you hear it and, um, and everything. But I remember actually telling my dad, cause I overheard him and my mama talking in another room about it. And I kind of walked in, I told him, I said, guys, and you can ask them to this day, they'll tell you, they like, I said, guys, look, don't worry about what people say. My play would do the talking for me. <laughs> Love and, it. I remember as a ninth grader going out on the basketball court and being one of the best players on the team because I wanted to prove that my dad wasn't playing me because I was the coach's son. I wanted to prove to them that I was playing because I was one of the best players on the team, even as a ninth grader. And uh, I remember the same thing happened to me in football as a sophomore. Uh, I ended up starting in football at quarterback as a sophomore, and I ended up beating this guy that was a senior and uh, and everything. And, you know, so that was, again – because my dad was a coach on the on the football team. They thought that I would be propelled. But I was like, no. I said, this guy's dad owns the biggest tire shop company in the in, in town. So I was just like, so I don't think the coach would be playing me over him if he need a new set of tires. So obviously I'm gonna have to really, I'm gonna have to really be better than this guy. So I ended up beating him out in the summer. Why? Because he didn't show up to off-season workouts. He made every excuse in the book why he couldn't be there. And he felt because his dad owned the tire shop that he felt like he was just supposed to be given everything. And I was there every single day, busting my tail, working hard, uh, preparing myself for the season. And the head coach was just like, you know, he told his dad, his dad came up to the field. He said, well, this guy has been here every day in the off season, working out, working out on the field. With these guys, he has earned the right to start. He's like, I'm sorry, but your son hasn't been to not one workout this whole offseason. And now school has started and you expect me to put him in front of the key. He said, I can't do that no matter who it is. And that trickled down through the whole football team because everybody saw that. And even my daddy did this to me one time. We was playing a basketball game somewhere. 
and I said something in a disrespectful way, <laughs> and he was like, oh, oh, you, you, oh, you going to get it. You going to get it, like right in front of all the players. So I had to get a paddling. And then I got it again when I got home. <laughs> and, then, and then not only that, he suspended me for like a halftime of another game just because my mouth being disrespectful when I suppose I brought a tape from the house for film room and I forgot it. And then he like that you he like, Jason, did you bring that tape that I that I told you to pick up before you left the house? And I said, No, nah, I forgot it. And he's like, What you mean you forgot it? I said, Well, if you saw it, why you didn't bring it? And that's Ooh, all I had to yep. say. It is just, <laughs> That'll get you every time. <laughs> I was in trouble. So you know, I, I just learned, man, to just, you know, I don't play favoritism. When I coach kids, I always I had a nephew and I coached his team. He didn't start for me until he had to earn the job. He thought because I was his uncle, he was going to start. But I told him, I said, no, if I do that to you, I'm doing you a disservice because when I'm not coaching you and somebody else is coaching you, they're not going to let you just start just for any reason. I said, you got to give them a reason to start you. I said, you got to work extremely hard and you got to beat somebody out. So, if you want to be a starter, then you need to beat somebody out because I'm not just going to hand it to you. So, Jason, I'm curious. You just said you, you're coaching some kids these days. What, what's the toughest kid to coach? Ooh, the toughest kid to coach is the kid that's uncoachable. You know, the kid that think they've already arrived. They have all the answers. You know, anytime you try to talk to them, they want to talk back because they're giving out so much lip service, I always call it. And they're not absorbing any information you're giving them because they're not taking the time to hear it. I was just like, so I'm constantly trying to talk to kids about be so be like, just slow down and listen and not be so quick to talk all the time. And I was just like, you're a, you're a young kid. I said, you don't know enough about the game to be trying to tell the coach what to do. I said, the coach is here to give you information so you can become a better player. I said, how are you going? I said, if I've been living longer than you on this earth, I think you I think you should listen to some things I need to be telling you. So those are the hardest kids is just trying to get through to them because let's just be honest. You know, nowadays they started ranking these kids in fifth grade. Oh gosh. And kids when I was coaching a basketball team, kids would tell me, Oh, coach, you know who we playing today? I'm like, who? I like, yeah, I know the team we're playing. Oh no, they got this kid on there. He's ranked the twentieth, the 20th best player. In the whole state of Georgia, I like, dude, he's in the fifth grade. What you know about <laughs> rankings? <laughs> Hundred you know? percent. Right. So right then they already defeated in their mind because they feel like they're playing somebody that's uh they're playing against somebody that's ranked because he's ranked that they have fear already. So it's it's teaching these kids not to get caught up into the rankings, not get caught up into a four star, five star, three star, all these different things. But teaching them like the reality of of playing the game and 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 being the best you can be because it is a hard fight nowadays because everybody wants to make the play to be on social media and trying to get them to understand that guys like sometimes the biggest play maybe not even be the shot that you took but the shot that you made the pass to your teammate to make in order for y'all to win the game. I was like, so it's not always about you having to hit the winning shot. I said, uh, it's about you making the right decision in crunch time. You know, I, I sit there and think, you know, of, of where you were at, obviously, growing up in high school. You know, so I, I got to ask you a couple things. I know your dad was one of your coaches, but because I always like this. Who was your – two-part question. Who's the worst coach you ever played for? You don't have to say his name. <laughs> but who was the worst coach and why? And who was yeah. the best coach you ever played for and why? Oh, man, I'd probably say – you know, one of my best coaches I played for was Al Borges um, at Auburn, 2004. And the reason I say he's the best because he knew how to take a multitude of talent and and make it all gel and work together. And, you know, we had a loaded backfield. We had a loaded, you know, offensive group. Our defense was good. And but in years past, they always felt like we just had to run the ball and, and everything. And he came in, broke down the whole film and said, you guys are leaving at least 20 plus plays of field on the field every game. And that's at least another 14 points that y'all not even putting up on the board because y'all are limiting y'all selves because of the type of offense that y'all are running. Like it takes, I always tell people, it, you can have a coach title, 
But if you don't know how to bring the talent together, it's just a title. I say great coaches know how to get the best out of the, their talent and to maximize the opportunities. And that's the thing about it. When when Coach Borges came in, he knew how to took all the talent that we had offensively and turned us into an offensive juggernaut where everybody on the team didn't care who touched the ball, didn't care who got the ball, as long as we was progressing and winning games. That's all that matters because you never knew whose number was going to get called. And it made everyone keep their antennas up and it made everyone be engaged because it wasn't dependent on one player. It wasn't dependent on just two players. We was dependent on everybody as a unit. So everyone took credibility to understand that you got to do what you got to do to take care of your job in order for everybody else to be able to take care of theirs. And he's one of the best coaches I've ever been around as far as doing that. Al Saunders was another guy when I was in the pros. Uh, you probably know him coaching with the Rams. Yep. They had the, you know, Kurt Warner and those guys. And I had him before in Washington, a little bit in Oakland. He was one of the uh, really good guys of putting the offensive game plans. But it was more so to me as, you know, what he stood for as a person as well, you know. And uh, and I just saw him at the college, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame a couple of weeks ago when I was up there with Richard Seymour. Yeah. And uh, so those two guys was two of the, my better coaches. I would probably say – Worst coaches without saying a name was guys that one guy actually he was coaching because his dad was a coach, but he didn't really like know the ins and outs of the game. And and that was that was a tough one because you're in a professional career and you're trying to play against some of the best players around. You want some you want the best teachers teaching you. You know, and not just because this guy got the title because his father was used to be a great coach. You know, I want to know that he put the effort in being a great coach. If you yeah. look at Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan is one of the better offensive minds in pro football. He learned under his daddy, Mike Shanahan, and that's why he's become one of the young great coaches because he actually put the time in to learn it. So I, I just feel like um, – you know, probably all of my career, I was blessed to have great, great coaches in my even in my high school career. My high school coaches probably made the biggest difference because they took no nonsense. Like they made you respect them in high school. They is the way you went to your practice field. You weren't allowed to be using profanity. You wasn't allowed to be, you know, there are certain rules they had in place. It didn't matter if you was the best player or you was one of the players on the team that wasn't even a starter. It was all about respect and discipline. And that started out for me in high school, man. And I tell you, when I got to college and to the pros, it wasn't hard for me to jump in line with respect and discipline because my high school coaches probably had the biggest influence on me. Awesome. Uh, more so than the pro coaches because that's where you gravitate kids the most is when they're in that high school and they're trying to, you know, grow from being that high school kid and get to that next level. If you let a high school kid do what they want to do, because of their ability and you feel like they're the best player on team and you feel like you're going to lose them if you don't allow them to do what they want to do, you're doing that kid a disservice for the rest of his life. If you sit that kid down and you talk to that kid and he doesn't do what, the what he's supposed to be doing from a team perspective and the team rules, then you don't play on Friday night. I'm sorry. Because you have to get that kid's attention because if he's going to run now, He's going to run when he gets to college and all of a sudden he gets to college and the coach don't let him do what he wants to do. He's going to hit the transfer portal as fast as it can get to him. And then he's going to hit the next one. It's going to continue to be a domino effect because no one took the time to say, I don't care about your ability as an athlete. I care about you as a person. In order for you to maximize your ability as, as, as an athlete, you need to maximize your ability as a person first. And I think my high school coaches, man, I would give the credit to uh, as far as being the biggest aspect the information in my life jason this is this has been great um one question I'd, I'd love to hear from you is if you had really one piece of advice to give a young athlete say that's an elementary school or middle school that's just beginning their journey uh, and they've got big dreams whether to play for their high school or whatever it is what piece of advice would you give them yeah i always tell kids don't let other people decide your future um the reason I say that is you've always heard some kids go out and they try out for a team and maybe they're not as good as they think they should be at that time. And, you know, you may hear, you know, a, a parent or a coach or someone, you know, tell them like, hey, you know, this is not for you or, you know, you're just you're just this is just not it. You're, you're wasting time. I always say don't listen to that because 
everything that you've ever wanted to achieve. I don't care if it's running a business, if doing anything, you're going to run into some hiccups and it's about you believing in yourself and not creating doubt. Don't have self doubt. If you're something you believe in and is inside of you, then you stick to it and you will be able to achieve it because no one gets to make the decision for you. Like people are not God. You know, you know, your belief in God and you know what God has for you. If you feel that way, you stick to it. And I think the biggest thing for these young athletes is there are going to come more people to tell you what you can't do than people that can tell you what you can do. But you got to have the, the, the disciplinary mind to understand what you can achieve and what you will achieve because you decided to stick it all the way through and not listen to the naysayers. And that's the biggest thing, because I remember being in high school and being that kid that I had some friends that was that was very jealous. And I remember them telling me to my man, the only reason you get in this, like Jeff was saying, because your dad's the coach and everything, those things stuck with me. And they told me. Uh, you would never get a D1 scholarship. Like you would never, you know, really amount to anything. And then that always stuck with me. So it made me work extremely hard. And even when I got to the high school, I'm from a small town, Taylorsville, Mississippi, and I was a number two ranked quarterback in the nation in high school. I'm just like, you know, and we were talking about 1,500 people. So then when I go into Auburn and we go undefeated and then you go into the pros, and you have a 10 year career, the same guys that told me that back then when I started doing camps back at Jones Junior College in the pros, they was the first ones want to sign up and bring their kids to, to the football camp. And then the first ones that want to sit and talk to you and everything. Why? Because they was the ones that doubted me. And I, and I, more I look at it, the guy played the same position for another school. It wasn't that he was doubting me. It was a doubt that he had in his head and his mindset because he was trying to compare himself to what I was doing yeah. instead of trying to just compare himself to himself as far as like, how can he get better? So it just, man, I just tell kids, don't listen to what everybody try to, not everybody's for you. So don't think that every, every person that lines up beside you or every person that talks to you is for you. Make sure that you, you know, that you stick to yourself and stick to what you know, because, and don't get caught up into jealousy whatever bothers you let it drive you and just keep working for keep working hard jason those are great words for kids to hear uh i want to ask you something that i think some parents and, and kids too will be interested in you mentioned that you're involved in nil uh with auburn uh it's pretty new for for most of us who aren't you know in the nitty-gritty of it where's it all going, man? Can you, can you just shed some light on your thoughts <laughs> yeah. on where it's all going? Yeah. NIL is coming the, our way. I know that. <laughs> yeah. We came through too fast. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. But I tell you what, it's a great opportunity for kids. Now uh, they have an opportunity uh, to basically, you know, earn some money for themselves while they're, while they're in college. And, you know, it's based off their name, image and likeness. Uh, that's what NIL is, is not play for play. I mean, pay for play. But the main thing behind it is like I like anything. If you're out in that field, and you're making noise and you're doing great things. And that means your name is probably going to be growing. So that makes people want to want to touch you a little bit more. People want to you know be a part of you. Back when I was playing, people couldn't even buy you a hamburger. You know, it would be considered illegal. So now, you know, I tell these kids, man. It's not so much always about the money. Like everything now seems to be about the money. Like when kids go on recruiting visits and different things, and when they get to these colleges and everything, the first thing they want to know is, you know, what my NIL deal is going to look like. You got kids making decisions off now off colleges based off where they feel like they can go and make the most money at rather than you know, do it, does it fit me? It's just like when you get married or you're going to be married to an unequally yoked marriage, or you're going to be married to some one that y'all are equally yoked. So a lot of these kids are making decisions now off colleges that they may take a short term to say, Hey, I want to go to this school because I know that NIL probably going to be able to pay me such and such amount of dollars, but I know I'm a better fit at this other school. I know I have a better relationship at this other school. So but instead of me just saying, I'm going to take my chance and go to the school that I have the best relationship with, because in the long run, it may work out better for you. 
they go and choose a school that feel like it can get them more money from an NIL standpoint. And but once they get there, they're not happy and they don't enjoy it because they chose it because of money and not because it was somewhere they feel like they loved and wanted to be. So I always try to help these kids, man, from a mentor standpoint. It is really a tough ball game now because parents are pushing for for different reasons now. And rather than the kid going to the school to figure out, hey, you know, does the kid fit this school? Does the kid fit this program? You know, from a from a standpoint of education wise, education is not even brought up no more. And yeah. that's the sad thing about it. You don't even hear about the education standpoint. And I have to sit down and talk to these parents once they sign in on campus. And I have to tell them, like, hey, guys, look, I'm going to be honest with you. About 98 percent of the guys that come through the locker room within the next two years would not play at the national football level. I said, I know it sounds tough. I, I know it's hard for you to hear that. I said, but I just want to be honest with you. I said, because at the end of the day, I said, your son now comes to Auburn. He's on campus. We can now give him an NIL deal. I said, so not only he gets scholarship money, he's getting a scholarship check. I said, he also can apply for a Pell Grant if his parents are not making a certain amount of money. I said, and then also you have a food card that you can eat your food, lunch, and breakfast off of. I said, and now you also have an opportunity to, to have NIL money that you can actually put into an account and start your savings account like now. I was just like, if it's me, I'm going to put that money up and try to live off my scholarship check because now when I leave college, I don't have a student loan I got to pay, but now I got a nest egg. So if I want to start off uh, in life, get me a, somewhere, a place to live or something, I got I a starting point. I said, but all you guys or think everybody's going pro. I said, I don't mind you having a dream. I said, that's that's part of the reason why you are being successful because you're shooting for something. I said, but I just wanted it to be reality. Don't sit here and and just live off this NIL money and feel like I'm going to blow through this because I know I'm going to the league in a couple of years. I said, it's not that way. I said, make sure you're being smart about it. Make sure you're being financially educated on how you should handle your money and your resources. But I said, guys, the biggest thing and the most important thing in all of this is build relationships. I said, you can go make all the money in the world and nobody will want to touch you or deal with you if you got a bad apple to you. I like, but if you be a person that people want to touch and involve and build relationships with, it'll carry you further in this life than that will. So that's been the biggest thing with NIL, man, is trying to get people to see around the finance part now. And it's unfortunate that college football is about to turn to pro football unless it becomes some parameters. But, um, you know, it's just the world that we're living in right now where yeah. kids and parents are – it's all – and some of them got agents, you know, 18 years old with agents, you know, just like, what are we doing? Yeah. You know, you, you speak about Canton a minute ago. We're finishing up here. But Richard Seymour is a neighbor of mine. We live in the same – right down the house, okay. street from each yeah. other. and. His speech with about family, I thought was one of the cool speeches I've ever seen. I thought he killed it up there. And so we're sitting here listening to you for the last 45 minutes. And obviously your parents were very instrumental in the success and development and the man you've become today. So, you know, you talked about you just got married. Obviously you're working on kids. We get that. So you have a couple kids and in fast forward seven, eight years from now, What's one thing that your parents instilled in you that you want to instill in your kids that you think ultimately drove you to where you are today? Oh, man, that's a great question. Uh, I would probably say one thing my daddy told me, uh, and I'm going to retract, is when I was in the pros, he said, son, I don't care how much money you make. He said, I don't care what you do as far as like financially. He was just like, at the end of the day, my job was to raise you to be the man you're supposed to be. And if you ever feel like you can utilize your money to dictate how me and your mama are supposed to treat you, then you already going down the wrong highway. Cause I would still beat your butt just like I did when you was a little kid. <laughs> so to me, that taught me so much more because it showed me he cared more about me as a person more than what I could do for them. And I think when I was a young man growing up as a young kid, my parents always instilled in me, man, like keep God first, you know, in everything that you do, you know, don't ever forget about him and uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, you give him the, the glory and the praise and all that you do and, and everything. Because and the other thing is 
what you think you're getting away with when no one's watching, you're not really getting away with it. You know, it's what you do when no one sees what you're doing and what's going to matter the most and what dictates character. And that's what dictates integrity. And I think that's the one thing my dad taught me. He was just saying, I can put you out there on the football field. I can put you out there on the basketball court and I can shut the door or I can leave the field. He was just like, you can tell me you was there for two hours. He said, but if you was there for two hours sitting on your butt, you just cheated yourself. You didn't cheat nobody else. You didn't cheat me. You didn't cheat your mama. You cheated Jason Campbell. And that's the same thing that always stuck with me that what you do when no one's watching and the work that you put in, I don't want to see, like I tell young guys all this all the time. I don't care about all the stuff you be putting on social media about what you do. How do I know if you're doing this when you're by yourself or you're just doing it for show? Don't do it for show. Like if you're doing these things that you say you're doing, then it doesn't even have to be on social media because it's going to come, like it's going to always rise to the top. So that's the thing he told me, man. Integrity and character come when no one is watching and no one sees what you're doing, but you're putting in the work when people think you're not. Hmm. Love that. It's a great way to end. I yeah, think, right there. I, I, I don't know what else. To, that, was, that demand, that's great. I think, uh, you know, like I said, you've shined a great light on, I think, on a lot of things today, but more importantly, you know, you, I think I appreciate you sharing with us and everybody else your childhood and the things that made it, you know, click. And of course you talked about your mom and dad, which I think is outstanding because I know for me, it's the same way, you know, how instrumental they were into getting me where I'm at. And these guys, I think the same way. Jason, thanks so much for joining us today. As, uh, as Jeff's just said, it was, uh, it was just great stuff. And, uh, we're actually, we're excited for, uh, for your next chapter and uh, to kind of watch you move into the parenting role. And uh, at some point, we'd love to have you back. <laughs> and uh, with that, we'll say goodbye and thanks again. Yeah, maybe a 10-2 and two Auburn Tiger season this year. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Thanks, hey, Jason. You know, who, yeah, who knows? You know, any, any time that Auburn is not a highly ranked though. That's when they do no well. Expectations, that's when we do well. Yep, so 100%. it's going to be a tricky season. <laughs> uh, thank you for joining right, us, yeah. man. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, yeah, no Jason. Problem. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it, guys. Hey, guys. Jeff Francoeur here. Thanks for checking out Pure Athlete. And subscribe to our channel on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you go to listen to our podcast.